we can start here. Cool. All right. Um, I'll get us started off. Um, so thanks everyone for um, joining us. Uh, we're students from the Stanford Optical Society. Um, we're grad students who go to Stanford who work on things that involve light. And we're really excited that you guys have joined us today. Um, we'll just introduce ourselves really quickly so you know who's going to be um, doing this presentation, doing these activities with you guys. Uh, my name is Lucia. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, Chris. Hi, I'm Rishi. I'm Dylan. John. Cool. Um, and again, thanks for joining us. And we're going to be talking about um, light and things interacting with light today. Um, so why don't you get us started off, um, Rishi? Yeah, so I'll start out with uh, something pretty nice um, and almost really quite simple to understand. It's called total internal reflection. And um, so let's first think about something called the fisheye effect. Um, now, this is um, actually a lens effect, which means a lens is any object that, that takes in light at different angles and sends out light at different angles, and often it's used to concentrate light into a smaller angle. And um, what we see here is that we get a really wide range of input coming from all different directions. So here we can see in this marble image, basically a 360 degree view of the outside world um, compressed into, into this circle. And uh, that's, that's an interesting physical effect which gets used in uh, wide field cameras. Um, it also gets used, uh, if you look on the door, on your door at home, if you have a peephole, uh, that's got a fisheye lens in there and that takes in light from all the angles on outside the corridor and compresses it so that you can see uh, you know, a wide view of what's going on outside. And so that's called a fisheye lens. Um, so now let's see how this works. On the next slide. Of course, it's called a fisheye lens because it mimics what a fish sees. So in the center there, when a the fish looks up, you can see the entire sky gets uh, compressed to a smaller field of view. Um, and then we'll also talk in a few more slides about the stuff that's outside that, that field of vision. So in the next slide, we've got the schematic and shows how light bends in the water. So you can see that the whole field of view outside the water gets compressed down to a smaller angle range and it's easier for the fish to see. This is an, actually an advantage to the fish um, and it makes things like spear fishing really difficult because not only can the fish move, but the fish can also see and it can see almost right up to the shore. Um, and so the fish has an advantage in, in terms of looking out. So now let's ask the question, um, what does the fish see beyond that point? Um, so in the previous image, we had this uh, bubble or an oval of light. And outside the bubble, we had some sort of dark region. So here's a question. What does the fish see beyond this point? If anybody has an, any ideas, feel free to throw it into the chat. Um, and also, if you have any questions at any point, feel free to ask us in the Q&A or chat. I think we have one answer that says nothing. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good guess. Uh, darkness, another one, yeah. These are good ideas. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but one side, hmm, that's interesting. What do you mean by one side? This could actually, yeah, th there are two sides in this, I guess. There's a side outside the water and the side inside the water. Um, so you've got the right idea there when, when you say one side. It turns we, have, out that so, uh, we have one more answer in the Q&A that said everything would look compressed. Everything would look compressed. Um, well, that's inside the, the you know, the, the, the angle that the fish Ooh, sees. One person says mirrored. That's very close. That's, yeah, that is very close. That's very close. All right, so let's reveal the answers. I think we've pretty much, we're almost there. Um, so the fish actually does see 
a mirror image of what is under the water. So you were right when you said one side, that being the side that's underwater. And you were also right when you said mirrored. Um, so this is actually a phenomenon known as total internal reflection. So the fish sees reflections of objects that are under the water around it. Um, and actually, if you've ever been swimming in a really large pool, you might have seen the same effect. Um, in the next slide, we have an underwater image taken inside a swimming pool. Up above, you can see the ceiling lights, um, and that's the outside world. And then beyond that, at larger angles, what you can see is actually the bottom of the swimming pool. Uh, so you've got this really cool kind of box effect, like it, it seems like you're actually swimming inside a box rather than uh, you know, an open swimming pool. Now, to explain this sort of more scientifically, what happens is that light that's below a certain angle, originating from inside the water, so underwater, um, is escapes. And light that's beyond that angle, and that's this critical angle here that's highlighted in purple, um, beyond that angle, what happens is called total internal reflection. So we have a question in the chat that says, would the mirror effect in the pool only occur if the pool surfaces were lit up? That's a good question. Uh, I, I guess it would be easier to see if the pool surfaces were lit up. But the effect would recur occur regardless. Yeah. It's a property of the water. That's right. And so in the second image, we have the same fish that we were talking about at the beginning. And we're looking up at the fish. And we can see the fish's mirror image. So this might make spear fishing a little bit easier if we were actually underwater. Anyway. We have one question in the Q&A that would go really well with this slide. It says, how do fish see the shore? Oh, so that's in that slide where we were showing you the, um, the, the rays that come in from the shore. Um, well, it might not occur 100% of the time, especially because the shore is kind of on that boundary. So the rays that come in from the shore are, come, are skimming the surface of the water. And so there may be a bit of uh, you know, additional reflection and interference effects there. But for the most part, stuff that lies above the shore line, let's say, would come into the fish's view. So that's kind of, be, oh. you can kind right. of see that in this, uh, in this image. So um, the stuff that's, the light that's in green that originates within the water, um, bounces right back into that center point. Um, and you can see the, the light that's skimming the surface of the water doesn't really get seen as well. Um, but the rest of it, it's very clear. Okay, so that's total internal reflection. And now we're gonna see how this can be used in so wave guides. I'm going to attempt to demonstrate this effect live in my special scientific lab called my bathroom where it's dark. We can actually see this better. So what Rishi was saying, let me close my door and turn the light off. So what Rishi was saying was that light, can you guys see this okay? Was that light interacts whenever you have a change in, in medium. So when I go from air to water, the light can either reflect or it can pass through and bend. But if it hits at a certain angle, and can you guys see this? If it hits at a certain angle, the light will bounce off the interface and remain trapped inside of the water. This is what's called total internal reflection. It's as though the surface of the water itself is acting as a mirror for the light. However, if I come in at the wrong angle, that doesn't happen. The light just passes straight through. Can you guys see that? Actually, you can see a little bit of the water, a little bit of the light is getting trapped. So the majority isn't. However, if I come in at a different angle, all of the light gets trapped. Can, can everyone see this okay on my screen? I hope so. Now, 
Let's see. Let's see if I can demonstrate this effect with a moving stream of water. And bear with me because I haven't tried this before and I need to turn the lights on so I can see for part of this. Dylan, we had a question in the chat. Are those waves? Yes, they are. Um, the, uh, the bouncing that you see is um, not a wave, probably in the sense that the questioner is thinking, but um, light itself is a wave and this reflection phenomenon is a property of waves. So all of this is related to wave mechanics. Okay, now then, can you guys see this quinine water here? By the way, this is not just water, this is water with quinine in it. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen tonic water at the store, it's kind of like bitter water, but it has a molecule in it that lights up when uh, a laser of a certain color hits it. So this, this blue laser here will light up this quinine water and that's why you guys can see it. Now, let's see if you guys can see the water or see the light that's traveling through this stream of water here. Do you, do you guys see the light traveling through the water? See the, do you see the light traveling through the stream? Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> oh yeah, thanks for answering. I was a rhetorical question. But notice what's interesting about this. Usually light only travels in a straight line, but if it's trapped inside of a material like water, then it follows the path that the water is taking and you can bend light. Now, this is very important for uh, the, the next slide, please. Uh oh, where did my screen go? Let's see. We have four fiber optics. Now, we can use this phenomenon to make a wire, and the wire will conduct light exactly like how uh, a, a plug in your house might conduct electricity, except we can do it with light. Now, fiber optics aren't made of water, but they're made of a, of a material, glass usually, that has very similar properties. That, that effect you were seeing where the light was bouncing around and being trapped inside of the water, that's exactly what happens in these long strings of glass. And there are many, many, many of these things wrapped in cables, buried underground and thrown in the ocean. And you can use this to communicate information. So here's a map of a lot of the fiber optic connections that exist in the world. You can see some connecting the East Coast to Europe. You can see more going across the Pacific Ocean, connecting the West Coast to China. There's some going all the way around Africa. These can all carry information at the speed of light from one place to another. And the great thing is that since light stays trapped in these fiber optics, you can make the light go anywhere you want. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to communicate, say, from one room to the other because there's a wall in the way. But with a fiber optic, you can just make it go around the wall. And that's basically how the internet works. The internet is mostly carried through fiber optic cables now. We have a couple questions in the Q&A. Um, someone asks, is white light made of all the colors of the rainbow? Yes. Yes, that's, that's pretty much correct. Yeah, so what your eye sees as white is not a specific color, but uh, all the visible colors mixed together, whereas black is the absence of all of, all of the colors. So yeah, that, that's pretty much correct, yes. And someone asked, what is an endoscope, um, which oh, we showed on a question. previous slide? An, an endoscope is a scientific use of exactly that phenomenon I was talking about. Well, if you can send light through a fiber optic, why can't you send an image through a fiber optic? It's a little, so it depends on how the endoscope is built, but you could build an endoscope out of a bundle of fiber optics and look in one end and see an image that, that was being projected in the other end. Although I suspect that most endoscopes are a little camera with a wire coming out of it on a, on a long flexible tube. But you yeah. can absolutely build an endoscope that's, uh, with a fiber optic. 
To add to that, uh, they're usually used in surgeries um, where they put a camera uh, or try to get an image of the inside of your body through a long tube so that they don't necessarily have to cut you open. Um, someone asks, what are fiber optics again? They're long strings of glass. So take any glass in your house, any cup that's made of glass, melt it and stretch it into a long wire. That will work as a fiber optic, more or less. Um, um, how can light carry information? That's another really good question. The simplest way of thinking about it is I can send you a signal that's either yes or no by either turning the light on or turning the light off. So if you're looking in the end of one fiber optic and never look inside a fiber optic because there's light in it, it will hurt your eye. But let's say you were and uh, I wanted to send you yes, then I could turn the light on at one end and you'd see it on the other end. If I wanted to send no, I could turn the light off. Now, if I do this many, many, many times, I can send a string of yeses or nos or ones and zeros and build up a communication system that way. So light is usually used to transmit information by turning on and off in, in, uh, in specific sequences. And what is the efficiency of a fiber optic? That's another really good question. Do you need a booster? Um, yes, that is uh, the fiber optics are lossy. Uh, you do get significant loss over many, many, many kilometers. And you put a fiber amplifier in the middle that amplifies the light in the fiber optic periodically. They, they're like once every, actually, Rishi should answer this one, but I think you need one like one, one every 100 kilometers or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I can take the next uh, two questions as well. Yeah. Um, so the efficiency, uh, as Dylan said, fiber, fibers do suffer loss. And about every 60 kilometers, um, 60 to 80 kilometers, um, you days. need what, what are known as um, fiber amplifiers, which take in the light and send out the light at, at pretty much the same input power. Um, so the same signal that you sent in um, gets amplified every so often. Um, and so these stretch over like thousands of kilometers. Um, the next question says, if, is the internet signal more fast than light? Uh, no, in fact, the internet signal is as fast as light. It's carried by light. Um, nothing can travel, information can't travel faster than the speed of light. Um, and it might be slightly slower because it is glass after all. Um, now, do we not really use fiber optic? Actually, we do use fiber optics across land, actually more extensive than water. It's just that the water ones connect continents. Um, and so they're really important for worldwide communication. Now, communication inside, uh, you know, inside a continent between countries that does get carried on land in terrestrial cables. Um, maybe we'll take a quick break from these questions and we'll go to it at the end. Um, and we'll make sure that we answer these um, at the end so that we can um, move on to our next section. All right, so I'm going to do a quick activity um, that you guys can do at home. Um, so if you go to this link that's provided on this slide, and um, someone can also link it in the chat, um, this is you'll find there a materials list and um, another set of instructions that we're going to show you, like just like the ones that we're going to show you today about how to make these fiber optics explosions, which is a really fun activity to show how light can be tra light can travel along curved paths like Dylan showed. Um, so yeah, if someone wants to throw that in the chat and then um, we can um, take it out of screen share mode so that I can do this activity really quickly. Um, so can everybody see me? Uh, am I the one that you're seeing? <laughs> There we go, cool, awesome. So what we're gonna do today is make these pool fiber optic explosions. And the um, what we're gonna start with is a really cheap version of the optical fiber that we talked about. So this is a plastic fiber that you can buy um, on Amazon. And we put a materials list on that link, um, but you can find it, that's just a suggested list. You can find these materials anywhere on Amazon or Home Depot. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to wind this around our, our hand um, just a couple of times so that we can cut it. 
And if you have scissors or wire cutters, make this really easy. And you just cut this loop. Um, I'll put it this way. So we can cut this loop. And you should get a little bundle of fibers. And what we're going to do with this bundle of fibers is that we're going to take something called heat shrink tubing. So this is something that you can find on Amazon or Home Depot. Um, and it's just tubing that shrinks when it's heated. And we're going to cut off a little section like this. And then we're going to also take an LED. So this is a color changing LED. If I put a battery on it, you can see it. Oops. You can see it change colors. And we're going to take this LED and put it into the heat shrink like this. So it's just sticking out. And then we're going to take our bundle of fibers that we made earlier and also stick it in the heat shrink with the LED. So you have something that looks like this. You have fibers sticking out of one side and an LED sticking out the other side of the heat shrink. And now what we need to do is heat it up. So the tubing will shrink around everything and hold it into place. And you can do this with a heat gun um, or you can do it with a hair dryer if that's what you have at home. So that's what I'm going to do right now is heat it up. I guess it might be a little hard to see. After I have heated it, it will look like the bundle will look like this. So the, the tubing has shrunk around all of the fibers and the LED. And then the last thing we're going to be doing is putting a battery in it so that the LED will light up. So you'll just take one of these three volt coin cell batteries and put it in between the leads for the LED. And then you can see that the LED shows up at the end of these fibers. And so the light is traveling down the fibers, just like it was in the water waveguide that Dylan showed, because it's bouncing around inside these, um, these plastic fibers. And the final step is to take some tape and just tape your uh, battery on so that it will stay in place. And to show that these fibers also work when they're bent, we can heat up these fibers so that they melt a little bit and bend into some cool shapes and look like a cool fiber optic explosion. We'll do that right now. So you can see that even after the fibers are bent, the light's still coming out of all the ends of the fibers because they want to be trapped inside the plastic, just like they uh, want to be trapped in the fiber optics that lie under the ocean. And so this is a cool, fun activity. Um, you can also tape it to a clip and clip it onto your clothes or in your hair. Um, and you can do this at home with some really cheap materials. Cool, thanks for that, Lucia, appreciate it. So here's the link again for everybody that wants to try this at home. Uh, so we're gonna be changing gears a little bit, uh, talking about another property of light. Uh, so the wave nature of light, right? And in order to demonstrate this, we're gonna be talking about measuring the width of a hair. Um, so to begin, let's think about how we can actually measure the width of a human hair. And I don't need to remind you that the width of a human hair is very thin, right? Um, so in the chat or in the Q and A, feel free to provide some some insights or some some methods to per, to how you would actually measure the width of a human hair. Uh, and if you guys can read them off, I can't really access the the chat right now. <laughs> yeah, no problem. And I guess try to think of methods you know that are inexpensive that you don't really need 
that much equipment, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because everyone's going to say, oh, SEM or something like that, right? Um, yeah. So think of very low fidelity, very low like level stuff that you can do. An SEM would work. A really yeah. powerful <laughs> microscope would work. That is a valid answer. <laughs> uh, what about like a magnifying glass? That's my idea. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. If you know, yeah, if you know like the, the magnification and can back it out, yeah. Are people coming up with good stuff? Nanometer microscope. That, yes, that would work. <laughs> yeah, that's like a... There's actually a much simpler way that I can do with this laser in my hand here. Take a picture next to a scale bar. It's another it's a idea. tiny scale bar. Ah, but how do you <laughs> find a scale bar that's that small? Exactly. There's only, your eyes can only see something so small, right? So. Oh, this is a cool idea. Get them to measure um, hair to one inch and then divide by the number of hairs. So I'm guessing that ah, means like if you have, work. if you have like a whole bunch of hairs, but you know how many right. hairs you have. Right, right. Assuming well, all the hairs are the same width. Long time. You can have different widths of hairs though, right? You'd get an average, that would work. Yeah, yeah, that would take sure. a long time. <laughs> I wonder if we can do this against the wall. Lucia, you said this didn't work, right? Let's see if we can do it. Let's, uh, we're, <laughs> let's do the ripple <laughs> tank bit. Yeah, we're kind of jumping the gun a little bit here, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll. <laughs> Oh, right, make a get... shadow on the wall and measure. That's a great idea. Shadow, ooh, that's close. For that's sure. a very good idea. Yes, you could use an electron microscope, but that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just has one, right, in their garages. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, I guess, keep going here, if, if you guys don't mind. I don't know if we have any more. Um, anyway, so. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about the wave nature of light, right? So this is going to be very important in doing something like this. So let's use the wave property of light. So first, we have to introduce the wave property of light, right? Um, so light can also behave as a wave. So imagine you have a flashlight like we do right here, and it launching. I'm not, I don't want to say you know like some jargon here, but basically it's a, it's a wave of light. And you know I could give you equations to sort of describe how it propagates or how it moves, but for now let's just keep it simple. So if we think of a wave. It sort of goes up and down, right? Peak and trough, like over and over again, right? And the distance between these peaks is called the wavelength. So that's that little uh, Greek symbol there, that little squiggly, it's called the lambda. But so that's the wavelength, right? So it's the length between two peaks in a wave, right? Um, but just to sort of ease into it, are there any other types of waves that you have seen in your life or come across in your life? And feel free to put them in the chat or Q&A. And if you guys can again like list them off as they as they come in. So other other waves that you've seen in light or in life. <laughs> yeah, ripples on water. Ooh, water waves, right? That's very big. I'm pretty sure we've all seen we've all drink drunken water, right? So we've all seen water waves, right? Are there any other waves that you've seen? Heat. That's interesting. Heat waves. Heat waves, like, yeah. They're called waves, aren't they? There could be compression waves made out of heat. Sound yeah, waves. Okay. We have sound waves coming in, sound. Ooh, sound wave, that's a good one. It's a pressure wave, right? That's definitely a pressure wave, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Heat waves, like yeah. earthquakes are waves. Oh yeah, it's a seismic effect or a seismic wave. Yeah. Earthquakes are waves. They're waves traveling inside rock. Interesting, yeah. When we hear sound, that is that is a wave too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Give a few more seconds. If anything comes to mind. Vibrations, solar waves. Solar wave, stadium waves. I like stadium. it. Stadium. Oh yeah, I was. Oh man, I was waiting for that one. 
<laughs> gravitational waves, yes. Gravitational waves are waves. Oh, that's a sophisticated yes. one, yeah. <laughs> the fact that they are waves is very interesting in and of itself. Yeah. Fortunately, not going to get into it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next session so, will be microwave, microwave, microwave oven. Yeah, that's another form of, of light, right? Um, so, okay. So let's uh, continue here. So you guys touched on what like a very common one is, right? Which is a water wave. Uh, so I'm pretty sure we've all at least seen the ocean or pictures of the ocean, right? Um, so they're basically water waves coming in onto the coast, right? And they sort of smash on these rocks. Um, but one thing I want to sort of point out, or what we want to point out, is that if you've ever seen a cove, so this sort of a structure here, where you have waves coming in from the ocean, and you basically, they crack, they're incident upon, or like they, they come into like this ch narrow channel. Uh, notice how these waves, you know, they come in fairly straight, uh, but as soon as they come into this channel, they sort of have like a radial, like a circular kind of movement, right, from, from this point here. Um, so that's going to be very important, and that's that's another um, sort of property that light can also, you know, have, and we're going to be talking about that right now. Uh, but for now, I'm going to pass it on to John because he's going to be talking about what these waves actually look like in real life. So John, if you could take it away, let me stop. All right. So um, the reason for my unusual zoom location is that uh, here we've set up a ripple tank. Um, and what this is, is that this is a big, uh, this is kind of just like a clear plastic tank. Uh, it has a little bit of water in it, maybe uh, uh, less than a centimeter deep. Uh, and we have uh, some equipment set up here so that uh, I'll just explain what this is going to do. So this thing is going to make some, uh, some waves in this water. So this thing is going to vibrate. And then up here, we have a light that's connected to uh, a ripple generator. And the light's going to strobe, so it'll flash on and off. And this will let us um, kind of uh, freeze the motion uh, of the waves in the water uh, when we're looking at them. So it'll look like they're standing still. Um, and then we're actually going to see kind of the, um, the light that goes through uh, these waves and is projected onto the bottom of the bathtub. Um, so I'm going to turn the lights off uh, in this room. I'm going to turn on uh, the lights on this uh, generator and we're going to look at some water waves in this tank. And uh, we're going to do this because uh, it turns out that the, the map that describes a wave is the same for water waves and for light waves. So we can see some of the same effects in this ripple tank that we would see with light. Uh, and just as a warning, uh, there might be some flashing lights in this uh, section. Uh, we're going to try to avoid it though. So let's see. Might take a second to line up the um, camera to see this well. All right, so uh, can someone let me know, can you see the, the waves? Yeah, it looks really cool. Yeah. All right, um, and if you see kind of a, a bar that's moving across the screen slowly, that's a really interesting effect called aliasing. Um, and it's because this is actually flashing really fast and uh, it's kind of too fast for the camera on my laptop to see it. So uh, this effect shows up. Um, so what we have here is, um, if you look at kind of this main section, uh, most of what we're looking at is uh, called a plane wave. Uh, so that's these flat lines here. And that's um, basically a wave that's only going in one direction. And what we're going to do is we're going to put some obstacles in the water and see how the wave uh, behaves when it goes through these obstacles. So just to show what I'm going to do, um, John, you should point out the direction the wave is traveling relative to the line. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so one thing that's pretty important is that the wave is actually traveling perpendicular to, uh, to these lines. So you can imagine if you look along one line here, uh, you'll see brighten and dark and brighten and dark. And you can think of that as uh, kind of the uh, um, 
the same pattern that we uh, saw on that slide for what a light wave looks like. Uh, so this is uh, along uh, this direction, you would see kind of a wavelength. So it's a good point. So the light is, uh, or sorry, if a wave is traveling perpendicular to these uh, flat lines. So now in this tank, I'm going to put uh, an obstacle and uh, I'm actually going to put two of these obstacles uh, so that I'm going to create a small gap between them and the light is going to go through, or sorry, the wave is going to go through the gap. And this might take a little bit of adjusting to get it to show up. So just bear with me. Um, we can answer a question while you're setting that up. So someone asks, what are those lines? Are they fiber optics? And those are not fiber optics. What we're seeing is the shadow of these water waves onto the bottom of the bathtub. So we have a light up top that's shining light through the water wave and um, it's showing up as uh, bright and dark lines um, because of the shadows of the peaks and the troughs of these waves. Um, and it looks like it's standing still because the light above is actually strobing at the same frequency that the waves are moving. So yeah, we'll um, show how that works uh, when you turn off the stroking in a second. Yeah. Um, but for now, so if you look in the middle where I put these obstacles, you can see that the uh, the the uh, what we call it wave fronts, um, those uh, lines that were previously straight are now going in a circle, and uh, this is showing us that the wave is spreading out, and it's actually going in all directions. Uh, so. What's kind of interesting is that you might think that the wave just kind of goes through the gap between these two obstacles and then keeps going straight, but actually putting a small gap in there makes the wave spread out and kind of go in all directions. Um, and this is something called uh, diffraction. Um, so yeah, one last thing before I uh, we go back to the slides, um, just to show what happens when I turn off the strobing. So I'm going to change this light from strobing to uh, uh, constant. And now you should be able to see the waves actually moving. Actually, the aliasing on the on the webcam is at making it look like they're still static. <laughs> All right. A little bit, yeah. Let me adjust the frequency. All oh, right. John, we had someone in the chat say that they didn't see the circle. Is it easy to do it again? Uh, yeah, we can try it again. And maybe point point out where the where they're supposed to look, because it's it's tricky to see sometimes. Yeah. There's a question that says, "What is a strobe light?" Uh, it's just basically a light that uh, turns on and off really fast. Yeah, if you've ever been to a haunted house, they use them a lot <laughs> to sort of do like an old movie effect. Okay, so. Um, I sort of don't have enough hands for this. Um, okay, so you should be able to see it right here. It's kind of hard to point at because it's actually the shadow underneath this on the bathtub. Uh, but there's this part that's kind of circular. And uh, as I move it further apart and then closer together, you can see that's. Oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. You can see it right there in yeah, the bottom yeah. left in our bottom right corner of the screen, the lines are bending in a circle. Yeah, it's actually, um, there's too much diffraction for us to, to focus on just the diffraction from the middle because there's also a diffraction from the edges. So when a wave goes past the edge of something, it gets a similar pattern. So that's why you sort of see uh, uh, two or three patterns going on at the same time. Uh, I think that's it for this. Let's share the screen again. All right, John, I think you could sort of tie everything together from the right. hair width experiment. <laughs> Uh, can we go to the next slide? Right, okay, so I think someone suggested um, 
but you could shine a light uh, or shine a laser at the hair and look at the shadow. So um, actually, it's um, it's a it's kind of complicated when you do that because you wouldn't just get um, uh, kind of a clean shadow. It's uh, what, what what happens when something is as small as hair um, uh, is that it's actually kind of on the same size uh, scale. It's about the same length as uh, the wavelength. Um, well, actually, it's much larger than the wavelength, but it's kind of getting there. Um, and so when that happens, you actually get uh, diffraction instead of kind of a um, a shadow like you might see with a really large object. Um, and what uh, is kind of maybe a little bit hard to explain is that when you have a wave, in this case, a light wave that's going past like a hair, so you can imagine this is kind of a cross section of a hair. Uh, the diffraction pattern that you get there is actually the same as uh, a wave going through a small gap. Um, and there's a, an explanation for this, but uh, I don't know if we have time to go into it. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think we have time to explain Babinet's principle, but. Uh, <laughs> um, so but, yeah. uh, I just want to point out that you can kind of see it from these circle shapes. If you draw a, a vertical line in your mind through the circle, you can kind of see that the line will pass through these vertical lines uh, a, a few times. And that corresponds to the pattern on the left. Yeah, this, uh, hopefully uh, that makes sense. This question of what, what, what is diffraction. So diffraction is just uh, what we call uh, this property of a wave that when it goes past a small obstacle or through a small gap, it starts to spread out in all directions. Um, so it's what we were trying to show for ripple tank and what we're going to use to measure the width of a hair here. Um, so yeah, um, like Dylan said, the, uh, the effect of having this diffraction is that if you shine a laser on uh, a piece of hair and then you look at the light pattern, uh, past the hair on, on like a wall, for example, you'll actually get a pattern uh, like this um, that you see on the left with this, uh, this red laser, where there's kind of a bright spot in the middle and dark spots uh, off to the sides, which might not be what you uh, immediately expect. Uh, you might expect there to be kind of a dark spot in the middle where the, the hair was, uh, but actually you get this kind of uh, pattern that comes from diffraction. Um, so do we have another slide? Uh, yeah, and, and the reason why this happens is uh, because light waves can actually cancel each other out. Um, so what you can imagine is that uh, if you have uh, two light waves like the light wave on top and they add up that you get a bright spot. But uh, when you have the light waves uh, on the bottom where uh, they're out of phase, uh, they actually kind of cancel each other out and you get a dark spot. So that's why you can get a dark spot even when there's kind of light um, that you think would be kind of spreading over that whole area. It's because uh, light waves that started from different places can actually cancel each other out. Um, so that's why we get this kind of pattern. Um, and we can use this pattern. There are some equations that uh, tell us uh, how big this pattern is when you know the wavelength of the light and the uh, um, the width of a hair. So we can rearrange those equations to tell us what the width of a hair is if we measure this pattern and we know the wavelength of light. And uh, so here we have some pictures of this experiment happening. So on the left, um, this is a hair taped to a laser pointer. Uh, the hair is really thin, you can see it here. Um, and then we're just shining that over some distance. And uh, so this is the laser pointer and then there's a spot um, on the far wall, and that gives us this pattern that you see in the third picture. And so there's we do a, oh, sorry, there's a good question that could be addressed right now. So the question is, does the light pass through the hair, or is the hair an obstacle around which the light bends? Yeah, it's the second one. Uh, the, the hair is an obstacle around which the light bends. It does not go through the hair, which is why um, hair kind of looks the way it does when there's a lot of it. Um, yeah, so um, uh, looking at this third uh, picture, uh, we're going to measure uh, the size of this pattern that we get from uh, 
from the, the laser going uh, past the hair. And uh, we're going to measure the distance between these dark spots. And that's just uh, what we're showing in this fourth picture. So I, there's a post-it note there, and you kind of put some marks on the post-it note where the dark spot are, uh, dark spots are, and you turn the light off and you measure the distance between them. Uh, and then we use this equation in the bottom left. Uh, so this is telling us that the width of the hair is twice uh, uh, lambda, that Greek symbol that we saw earlier that represents the wavelength. So that's just some number that uh, is the wavelength of light. And that's uh, for this laser, it's, uh, it's just labeled on the laser at 650 nanometers or 650 uh, billionths of one meter. Um, and then uh, I think L is the, uh, the, in this case, the length of the desk that we're measuring from the laser pointer to the pattern. And then D is uh, the uh, distance between those dark spots. So uh, plugging in the numbers that we measured here, um, do we have the answer on this one? Or do we need to actually do the math? I don't think so. I think it was an interactive kind of. Well, we can try <laughs> to do the experiment, and then I can use my magic powers of estimation to estimate the distance between the spots. OK, sure. It probably won't work very well, because it's going to be really difficult to see. But hopefully you guys can see my wall here. I have a hair that I'm holding in front of a laser pointer. And can you guys see the pattern that forms at all? Yeah, I see some of the dark spots, the bright spots. Do you see that? OK, maybe, maybe it's possible to see this. I'm holding it as still as I can. Let me go a little further away to make, this, make the spots bigger. Uh, is that easier to see? Yeah. yeah you see them. Do you see how there's kind of like that dashed line that's going across the wall? That's the diffraction pattern. Now, using my magic estimation powers, I can see that the, the uh, dots are about a centimeter apart. And using John's formula, we would get something like, I would guess, 50 microns. See, I'm about oh. two meters oh, wow. away from the wall. OK, I, I can't actually do that math in my head, but let's see. 2L lambda over D. So that would be 2 times 2 meters times 500 nanometers. So 2 times a micron divided by, uh, divided by a centimeter, something like that, gives me the I can't do the math in my head. I need a, I need a pencil or something. But you should end up with about 50 microns. Yeah. And, and if you uh, are able to try this at home, make sure you're doing it with an adult because uh, laser safety is very important. But um, the, uh, the kind of ballpark range that you should get is around 50 to, I believe, 200 microns is kind of the range of the width of people's hair, depending on your texture and um, like what type of hair you have. Um, My hair is thin, so I'm estimating 50 microns. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a question that says, what can you use this for other than calculating uh, hair thickness? Uh, good, good question. Well, um, if you can measure a hair, you can measure pretty much anything given the right equipment. So lasers are used uh, in, in precision measurements for everywhere because you can use the laser to measure various things against the wavelength of the laser, which is always known to very high precision when you make a laser. And that allows you to make very accurate measurements. Another thing that you can do is um, you can use what's called a diffraction grating, which is uh, kind of a lot of lines that are really close together. And uh, because where uh, how much the light spreads out depends on the wavelength of the light, which is um, it the, the wavelength of the light tells you about its color. So if you have a diffraction grating, you can uh, split light up um, into different colors, and you can measure how much of each there are. All right, I think that does it for the yeah, presentation, there is, at least. There's, uh, 
Oh well, yeah, that does it for the presentation. So uh, we have like a couple minutes. So if you guys have any other unanswered questions, um, feel free to ask them to us. One of the ones that came in is, um, what can an optical engineer do for a job? Oh, uh, let's see. What's a cool thing optical engineers can do? They can work on virtual reality. That's very common right now. Uh, optical engineers are in demand to make the uh, make the the optics make make the the optics for for virtual reality headsets. Um, that's a very common job that some of our friends get. Making telescopes is another one. Uh, lens lens design is another very common job for optical engineers. Anyone else want to chime in? I'm, there's a lot of jobs <laughs> I just picked two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Any kind of uh, like sensing devices, right? That you need like precision. You need to like track precision movements. You know, you're right. definitely the using field optics of for that. Spectroscopy, where where you measure you measure things using light, is a big field. Cameras, right. building that. microscopes for like biology. Um, Spectroscopy for biology is really big. Um, There's also much like less common jobs you could do that involve a lot of optics uh, as well. Like uh, I do, I work on particle accelerators that involve optics. So there's, there's, it's a very large field with a bunch of different subfields. It's not all like making lenses and stuff, but making lenses is probably one of the more common ones. Um, you could work right. in, um, what are they called? Servers, server farms, uh, data centers. That's what they're called, data <laughs> centers. <laughs> server. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, optical communications is also a pretty big field that ne always needs new engineers. Yeah, so like the maps that we showed of the fibers being laid under the ocean and uh, running the internet, a lot of people work on, on communications with fibers. So designing the lasers themselves, right? I'm pretty sure there's like a huge field of people just designing lasers for, I don't know, for manufacturing or like for, for metrology or like, you know, it's, it's just, there's just so many things with the lasers themselves even. True. The Nobel Prize in Physics uh, from last year, I think, was uh, to Donna Strickland for um, laser physics, essentially. Um, new types of lasers that can actually help in eye surgery, for example. Oh yeah, LASIK. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I I want to answer the one uh, where Soren asks if uh, you can help see in UV. I can do that for you right now. I wonder who he's gonna get. Remember this demo I was playing with earlier? This laser is a blue and ultraviolet laser. But look, you can see it. You're seeing ultraviolet light right now, sort of. The way that you see light that's outside of the visual range of your eyes, so infrared, ultraviolet, is you use special effects to, con not special effects like movies, like special types of optical effects to convert it to wavelengths that you can see. You can't make your eye see wavelengths it's not designed for, but you can convert wavelengths to things that you can see. So really, when I do this, you guys are all seeing ultraviolet light right now, or at least you're seeing where the ultraviolet light is, if that makes sense. I'm also dripping quinine all over my floor, so I should probably take this back in the bathroom. We have a couple other questions. So there was uh, any links to our websites uh, recommended for more learning, which is in fourth grade. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really good resources on YouTube, um, people who do demos like these. Um, we also do classroom visits, although now I guess it would be virtual classroom visits. Um, so if you're interested in that, 
There's, uh, there's an email address at the link that we provided earlier when we showed the fiber optic explosions. So our uh, website is photons.stanford.edu. Um, so we have a little bit of information there. I don't know, is there anything else you guys can think of? Um, okay, there's one more question about uh, light from distant planets can tell us what elements they contain. Is that true? Yes, that is that is true. Um, certain elements absorb and emit specific frequencies. And if you have a sensitive enough telescope that's sensitive to different frequencies, by seeing the light from other planets, you can tell what elements that are in that are in them. So do, did you see how the, the light that uh, that was coming off of that that bottle I had in my hands was a specific color? Based on that color, you could tell something about what material was inside that inside that water. And the same principle works for well for pretty much everything. This is Any procedure or experiment names to share? A telescope with a spectrometer attached to it is essentially the answer. If you get a telescope and attach a spectrometer, you can also do spectroscopy. Um, well, if there's no other questions for us um, in the chat or Q&A, thank you guys again for joining us. Um, you can find the links to the, uh, the activity that we showed um, in the chat. I believe it's photons.stanford.edu slash events slash outreach. And um, feel free to get in touch with us if you have any other questions. Um, it was great being here today and thanks again. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody.